We're so excited to introduce myself. I'm Joshua Goodero. I'm the director of new business sales with Fairy God Boss. And today's event is Understanding Neurodivergence at Work and Beyond. And it's sponsored by Philips. We're very excited to be joined by Heather Watts. She's the director of proposal management group for North America for Philips Healthcare. So Hi. welcome everybody. I'm gonna ask, oh, Heather, please introduce yourself. Oh. Hi everyone. And thank you, Joshua, for the introduction. I appreciate the opportunity. Um, as he said, I am the proposal management leader for Philips North America. Um, if you don't know what proposal management is, that's okay. Most people don't, um, but I essentially lead a team of project managers who, work with sales and marketing and operations, contracts, legal, to put together customer-facing proposal documents. And so I have an excellent team, best in the business, and they make my life uh, more enjoyable and more exciting every day at work. Uh, but with that, I have 13 years of experience in the healthcare industry, about 10 years of experience leading diverse teams. And I've been with Philips for almost five years, coming up in January, which is surprisingly fast. It's unbelievable how time flies. And um, when I'm not at work, I'm at home. My husband is also a Phillips employee, uh, so we get to talk about work a lot. <laughs> but he uh, is also a portrait artist. So we get to support his art. We also have three dogs that keep us on our toes and about, I would say, 63 house projects that are half finished around the house because I really enjoy interior design. But I also have ADHD, so <laughs> it's always like hyperfixation followed by complete abandonment, but I'll get them done eventually. So thank you for having me and uh, yeah, appreciate it, Joshua. Thank you. What wonderful experience you have. And hey, the first half of a housing a house project is the fun half. The second half is the boring part, right? So yes. no wonder. <laughs> thank I'm you excellent so. at planning. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So for, the, for the group, uh, today's topic, it's a very extremely important topic. Uh, there's a lot we're going to discuss. To begin, Heather is going to uh, help us to learn more about the initiatives that Philips is working on to better understand neurodivergence at work and beyond. So I'm going to turn it to Heather. She has a little presentation that she wants to give for the whole group. Awesome. Thank you, Josh. And uh, okay, everyone can see the slides. We're good. Um, so before I get into this, I want to say, first of all, thank you to all of you. Thank you to Philips and my colleagues there who have supported me in building this presentation. Um, Couple of ground rules. One, this is recorded, but please consider this a safe space to share your experiences and ask questions. All of us are on a learning curve, and so it's okay to allow yourself and others grace to ask the questions you think might be too simple. There's no such thing. Please feel free to ask questions and we'll get to them towards the end. Um, the other thing is there is a brief content warning. There's a brief discussion of suicidal ideation, but we it's at the outset and then we'll move forward from there. But I do like to give that warning. Uh, so let's, without further ado, get into it. Um, it's Halloween, let's get dark. There's nothing scarier than other people's baggage. So I wanted to talk a little bit about my history with neurodivergence and uh, how I came to become involved with Philips's uh, inclusion and diversity teams. So I have dealt with anxiety and depression for most of my life. I was first diagnosed when I was 10 and I have dealt with that on and off throughout my life. Um, most recently in about 2019, I began to experience a very severe period of depression, and with that came a period of suicidal ideation. And in that time, I was of almost two minds. <laughs> there was one part of my brain that said, of course, I don't want to hurt myself. I would never do that to myself or my family. And the other was this kind of constant drumbeat in my head telling me that the only way to overcome the existential pain I was going through would be to kill myself. And it got, you know, pretty dark <laughs> in that period. But here's the thing. Most people didn't know that this was going on. This was pre-pandemic. We were in the office five days a week. And I was able to get up and go to the office and be productive and be uh, a manager of a productive and engaged team. And very few people knew. In fact, there might be people on the call who worked with me <laughs> at that time that are very surprised to learn of how difficult it was for me. 
um, because it turns out I'm a champion at masking that pain. Um, and even though Phillips has a really inclusive environment and a really welcoming environment, I had worked at companies in the past that didn't have that same approach. It was pretty toxic, very competitive. And so any deviation from social norms was viewed as a weakness. And weakness was considered something to be ridiculed and discriminated against. So by the time this happened to me, I'd been at Phillips for a little over a year, but I was still kind of embodying those habits I had learned from earlier in my career. And it was almost instinctive. Um, so I was getting up and going to work and appearing relatively normal, whatever normal is. And then I would go home and spend all nights and weekends in bed um, and just exhausted from fighting the battle in my head with, uh, and also exhausted from wearing that mask all day. So I bring this up. <laughs> because it got better. <laughs> and part of that is because of Phillips. So we're out of the scary stuff. Um, early February 2020, uh, I made the decision to check myself into a psychiatric hospital on a short-term stay. And it was there that I was diagnosed with ADHD and also a form of OCD called harm OCD. Um, for me, that drumbeat was intrusive thought spirals. That was the obsession. And I couldn't act on the compulsion. And so I was just stuck in this spiral. Thankfully, I was able to receive medication and therapies to help me understand and control my OCD. Those therapies have reduced my depression and my anxiety. I'm now working my way through understanding and managing and living with my ADHD. And while I'll probably <laughs> need some form of therapy for the rest of my life, I am in a much better place. And in the weeks and months after that, I did go ahead and make the decision to self-disclose this neurodivergent situation that I was in with my boss, with some of my team, with my colleagues, because I needed support. I needed the flexibility to work from home or the flexibility to take some days off while I adapted to new medications. Um, I, I wouldn't say I was lucky to get out of the hospital right as COVID was starting, but working from home was hugely beneficial. <laughs> um, but when I spoke to my team, I was worried that I would uh, be ostracized. I might face demotion or wouldn't be met with support. And had that happened, I don't think I would be in a stable place. And I don't know that I'd be working with Phillips today because I would need that environment of support. Thankfully, I was met with nothing but support and appreciation and flexibility, um, which is great. And I think that feeling that I received from Phillips and from my colleagues is a big reason that I'm able to shake that mask and be more authentically myself where I am on a particular day. It took some getting there. <laughs> so all that said, I do consider myself lucky. Um, even at Phillips, not every employee has had that same support that I have. Um, we're working on that. You're going to hear a little bit about how we've gotten there. But um, I really joined in the inclusion and diversity groups and because I wanted to make sure that every employee felt supported, no matter where they were. Um, in particular, there are two groups that Phillips has started recently. Um, one is ABLES and Allies for um, employees with physical disabilities or chronic illnesses and allies who want to support those employees. And two is the Neurodiversity Network, which we've actually um, launched, I want to say just a few months ago, but it's doing incredibly well. It's building its membership very fast. Um, and I'm excited to be a part of those groups and the other ERGs that our team at Phillips provides because they create a community of safety and a community of support that I really appreciated when I was at my lowest point. And I hope that every employee has the opportunity to learn. But unfortunately, Phillips is not alone <laughs> in being behind. Um, a lot of employees are behind the ball when it comes to addressing and encouraging neurodiversity because they don't recognize the value. And so you're probably asking yourself why it matters. Honestly, if you're on this call, you probably already have the answer. <laughs> you're probably already asking yourself that question, but it matters 
because neurodiversity infuses every part of the employee experience. I love this quote from Tristan Lavender, who is a colleague of mine at Phillips, and he uh, actually founded the Neurodiversity Network. He is a champion of autism inclusion. He's an excellent writer. I suggest you follow him on LinkedIn if you don't currently. Um, and thank you, Tristan, for letting me borrow, steal this quote from you. <laughs> but it is true. He is right. If you see two people having a conversation, their two brains are different. No two brains are alike. And that interaction is going to be affected by the neurodiversity of those two people. Historically in business, this has been addressed by uh, creating social norms in the business. So you're expected to communicate a certain way. You're not expected to express these emotions, but it's okay to express these emotions. And shaking hands has a very intricate dance that we all do. And anyone who was neurodivergent was expected to adapt to those norms or leave and miss out on opportunities. Increasingly, we're seeing that perspective shift. And now employees are seeking environments where neurodiversity is not just supported, it is celebrated and encouraged. And so now the shoe's on the other foot. Companies have a choice to adapt and learn and grow with these social norms or lose out on potential talent and miss out on potential business. So next slide, sorry, um, there we go. So there is a lot of business that they could potentially be missing out on. There's a massive pool of untapped talent available right now. Heartbreaking stats, college graduates with autism, 80% of them are currently unemployed largely due to inaccessible working environments and inaccessible hiring practices by organizations who would benefit from that talent. 60% of adults with ADHD have said they've been terminated or they are forced to change their jobs due to ADHD symptoms. Again, that is a huge population of people that we're losing or sending to other companies because we haven't adapted effectively. And more widely, millennial and Gen Z workers um, who are increasingly the majority of the workforce today. They say that diversity and inclusion is very important to their choice of employer. In fact, if I'm remembering correctly, I think it was third <laughs> behind total compensation package, flexibility, and then diversity and inclusion. So this is essential for all of our employees, whether they're neurodivergent or not. And yet only 10% of HR professionals believe that they have accounted for neurodiversity in their hiring practices, their policies, and their culture. So there is a lot of work to be done and a lot of opportunities. And the companies who have taken advantage of that work have put in that time, they're seeing the benefits, reaping the benefits. Um, companies who have very prescriptively um, gone after recruiting autistic individuals or neurodivergent communities are seeing higher quality talent pipelines across the board, be it um, individuals who are autistic or neurotypical individuals. They are all flocking to these companies that have put in that effort to create an inclusive and accessible environment. They're finding lower turnover, they're finding fewer defects, higher productivity, higher engagement, and that all, of course, leads to higher profits. So failure to adapt, failure to build on this is going to leave companies behind. So it's essential to foster this inclusion. Um, so how do you do that? Lots of ways. And I think Joshua and I are going to talk about some of those in the, the fireside chat coming up. But I, uh, I asked about a dozen, no, four dozen. <laughs> Four dozen employees from various companies. Uh, what were the things that mattered most to them? And I'm sorry, the shapes got uh, changed there. The formatting got a little off, but it's okay. Three main ca categories of responses that I received. Communication, flexibility, and lived behaviors. A lot of different areas fall into those groups. But I want to stress the bottom, the foundation of all of this is empathy. I'll touch on that later. But know that by far the number one thing that came up was to lead with empathy and then build on that through communication, flexibility, and lived behaviors to create a neurodiverse environment um, that is safe and inclusive for all employees, not just some. So diving into communication, 
clear, concise, direct communications. This is essential, um, especially for individuals with autism. It can be very difficult to understand tone and nuance, sarcasm, um, fluff <laughs> is what I call it, um, flowery wording. Those can be difficult for people with sensory processing disorders or autism to understand. And so cutting that out, creating clear communications, that um, has led to an increase in um, engagement scores for companies that have done that across the board, both for people with autism and those um, who are not. They say, we appreciate that you're being direct with us. <laughs> Turns out all employees benefit. Transparent policies. Do not put it on the neurodivergent individual to say, I'm neurodivergent, I'm self-identifying, where are the policies for how I should operate within the organization? Make sure those are clear. Make sure that those are shared widely and that all the managers are aware of them. Um, and third is address your quote unquote hidden curriculum, <laughs> um, which you might be asking what the hidden curriculum is, and I'm glad you did. This is a term that came up most frequently in schools um, to talk about students who are in special needs programs, but I use it every day. <laughs> um, these are implicit behaviors, unspoken rules, unspoken expectations, things that most neurotypical employees will be able to pick up along the way. They can be extremely difficult for a neurodivergent employee to understand and adapt to. Calling them out um, and addressing them <laughs> has been a great way for us here at Phillips to help those employees feel welcome and understand kind of the culture and the social rules that we all have. Um, I've listed a couple of examples here. I can go into further detail later, but an example um, with my team, uh, Phillips's official dress code policy is casual, but for whatever reason, and I truly do not know why, my default is casual. So while a new employee would be well within their rights to show up in casual dress and be welcomed by Phillips, my team might perceive that being a bit more unprofessional. And so demonstrating that and showing and saying to a person, hey, you should be aware that this is kind of how it operates, gives that person the agency to make a decision. And it gives them an opportunity to adapt rather than having to learn that along the way and being potentially judged by coworkers in that process. So um, that's what I'm talking about when I talk about the hidden curriculum. We'll also say, it turns out that everybody appreciates uh, knowing these unspoken rules, not just neurodivergent employees. Um, so we'll, uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that um, with Joshua. Flexibility is also huge. Even if you're in a situation where everyone needs to be on site, that can be difficult for neurodivergent employees because that masking requires so much energy and because that process um, of an office environment can be really hostile to neurodivergent employees. There's still ways that you can incorporate them into your work, um, whether it's giving special flexibility to that person, saying if you need to work from home today, that is okay. Or if you need to work from a quiet space on another floor, that is okay as well. Just letting somebody come off camera so that they don't have to worry about how their face looks and how their tone is being presented. Let them turn their camera off for virtual meetings. The amount of energy that neurodivergent employees will tell you that they save is huge um, just from not having to be on camera all day. Um, flexible or asynchronous work hours. I understand that not everyone can do this, but my most productive hours are usually from about 4 p.m. to 9 p.m. and I work a nine to five. So I have to adapt um, to be able to fit into this world. Understanding that maybe I'm gonna need to do some work on the weekends or maybe I'm gonna need to work in the evening and allowing me flexibility to make up that time during the day or during the weekday, that allows me to be my best self and allows me to bring my best work to the table. Um, so flexibility just in when a person works is huge. And then finally, physical assistive devices. This could be as simple as telling somebody that it's okay for them to wear a hat because the lights in the office are too bright and they cause overstimulation for a neuro neurodivergent employee. Um, this could be something as simple as a posted rule that 
no one gets to microwave fish in the microwave because those smells can be extremely just upsetting to all of us, but especially to neurodivergent employees. There are little things that can be built in and just offering that flexibility, even if the employee doesn't take you up on it, offering that flexibility. Time and time again, I heard from our employees um, was enough. They just wanted to be heard and they wanted that option because that gives the power back to them rather than being at the whim of the, the employee. I'm gonna take a sip real fast. Lived behaviors, finally. <laughs> this is how you create a culture of psychological safety. You can say, oh, we have this ERG, go and join people like you, and that be the end of it. That will end up damaging the employee's trust in you. It will tell them, like, I get, it's okay for me to talk to these people, but not to the wider company, and I'm only safe to be myself over here, but not over here. You need to build this into your culture, and you need to demonstrate it through action. So inclusion. That could be leaders who sponsor events that celebrate neurodiversity or sharing stories. Um, here at Philips, we have a leader in marketing who just did a presentation on uh, dyslexia and how he has dealt with that through his career. And it was incredible to see somebody who has advanced relatively high in his um, organization while dealing with severe dyslexia. Um, it was inspiring to see. Um, another way you can do this is commit to hiring quotas and then publish the actual results. Uh, SAP is a company that has really focused on hiring autistic individuals. They committed to, I want to say, 10% of their population being represented by autistic employees. And every year they publish how many people who have self-identified as autistic have gone through this program and are still with SAP. Third thing would be to educate the entire population. Don't put this on of one person to go out and do their own research or don't make it focus solely on the community that is experiencing this divergence. Make it universal. This is something that Philips has really started to develop um, with our incredible inclusion and diversity team. They um, send out education as part of our corporate trainings on uh, psychological safety, on uh, dealing with neurodiversity, about managing and hiring and understanding. There are courses available to everyone, and some of those are assigned so that every manager <laughs> goes through them, and we all have a universal understanding of the expectations. Um, and finally, set policies that discipline employees who don't act in accordance with your values. This came up a lot when I was interviewing uh, employees because they would say, 90% of my company is on board and very supportive, but that 10% that does something where they mock or ridicule, ridicule or discriminate, they can ruin the culture for me. And what I see is my company not backing me up <laughs> when that happens. At Philips, we have policies in place, which are great. We are very clear about our ethics and our values and what we care about and how important it is for our employees to bring their whole selves to the table. And so when somebody is detracting from that experience, we have policies in place to act on those and ensure that everyone is aligned on our values. If you don't currently have that with your company, I strongly encourage you to do that <laughs> as quickly as possible um, because that singular detractor can ruin all of the work that you put in in your culture. So there's that. And also, just finally, I want to reiterate, empathy always. This is true for neurodivergent employees. This is true for neurotypical employees. I consider it kind of my credo as a, as a people leader and as a manager. And I say empathy before ambition, empathy before everything. Um, leading with empathy, speaking with people with empathy, learning about the different perspectives that somebody might have is the single greatest weapon that an organization or an individual can have. So I really encourage people to think about how they can increase empathy in their own organizations. And um, I hope that you already have an organization that has it. If not, um, hopefully we can work together to culture in your organization.
So uh, yeah, that is <laughs> the end of the presentation, but I know we're going to transition into the fireside chat here shortly, but I did want to share my contact information. I love talking to people about their own experiences. I love to help other organizations um, with their cultural needs. So please feel free to reach out if you have any questions at all. So uh, with that, Joshua, do you want to come back on stage? Thank you so much for that presentation, Heather. First of all, it was wonderfully put together. Oh, very thanks. clear, very easy to understand as we were looking it through. And Perfect. thank you for sharing your personal story and experience. That's not mm -hmm. an easy thing to do, but you know, when you were sharing it, there were a number of people in the comments who began to share their own experiences mm -hmm. uh, with their forms of neurodivergency that they might be experiencing. And so thank you so awesome. much. It was very encouraging. Let's um let's dig in here a little bit. And to the audience, I'll remind you. Keep putting your questions in the comments. Me and Heather got a couple of questions we want to make sure we hit during this discussion. And then at the end, we're going to make sure to go back and answer some of the more specific questions that you as an audience have been asking. Okay? So keep it up, and we'll, we'll get to that in, in just a minute. Um, mm -hmm. So you were talking a lot about some of the support that Phillips has been giving you. Mm -hmm. You were giving some very clear advice on, on how companies can do better. Let's mm -hmm. dig in more. Let's look for some more tips, some more tools of the trade so that we can celebrate those who have neurodiversity uh, at mm -hmm. work. What can the employers do? What can the employees do to mm -hmm. make sure that they're focusing on this? So from an employer perspective, celebrating neurodiversity oftentimes is as simple as a neurodiversity day, a, a webinar, an event, calling attention to the fact that we see everyone as a variety of neurodiverse types, everyone comes from a, a variety of backgrounds, and we encourage and bring that to the forefront. I think from an organizational standpoint of putting that in your values and making it clear that we celebrate and backing it up with those lived behaviors like I talked about, that is huge. For employees who are hoping to build <laughs> a more uh, neuro-inclusive um, organization, that, um, that can be more difficult. It can also really depend on your particular type of neurodivergence or your uh, particular accommodation needs. But I think it's important to ask. <laughs> I like to tell my team the worst thing that anyone can ever say is no. So if I were to go to my HR manager and say, hey, I'd like to start an ERG for neurodivergent employees, more than likely they're going to say, yes, I would love to do that. Let's work together. At worst, they will say no. It is highly unlikely that they will say no and then slap you in the face and steal your cat and then fire you from the company. It's not going to happen. <laughs> so if the worst thing they can do is say, is say no, the best thing you can do is ask. So if you're with a smaller organization that may not have a diversity and inclusion group, um, that probably defaults to HR. Talk to your HR rep or talk to your manager if you feel comfortable. Um, if you don't feel comfortable self-disclosing your neurodivergence, you can always present yourself as an ally who is interested in getting involved. Um, and that way you kind of protect yourself until you feel safe disclosing it. Um, the other thing is, uh, ask internally <laughs> if you have an internal social network um, if you have an internal bulletin board any kind of forum ask if there are other people who are interested in forming a group um, or interested in hearing more about neurodiversity more than likely like you can see from the comments that are coming through people have experiences that they want to share and they have ideas of how to improve their company so if you say i would like to get into a conference room at nine o'clock on Thursday, I will be there with donuts. That will probably get you 10 people. <laughs> if they don't show up, you got some donuts, that's great. If they do show up, you have a group of people who are sharing a common cause and a common passion. And that's a great way to start. Very good. And, and you know, I'm in sales. So <laughs> the worst they can say is no, exactly right. And yeah. they can try to take that cat. They, 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 <laughs> they think they're gonna take that. But also, in sales, you know, one of the things we learn, Heather, is that very often getting somebody to say no isn't the end of the conversation. That's the beginning. Yeah. So use your example. They might say, no, right now we don't have the resources to put together the ERG for people with neurodivergency. Mm -hmm. But that probably actually will spark an internal conversation. Mm -hmm. HR with leadership saying there's a want for this. We don't have the resources now. How can we plan to have the resources in the future? So, yeah. you know, most of the time it's no or not no forever, but it's no right now. And, and yeah. it starts the ball rolling, you know? Yeah. 
That's a great point. Um, and I think that is also something, there are a lot of things that you can do if you don't have resources or if you don't have formal support from your organization yet, there are small things you can do. I talked about the hidden curriculum. Um, this is something that I essentially went on to Reddit, LinkedIn, Twitter, and I started asking people with neurodivergence, um, what would your ideal workspace look like? What do you wish that you had been told when you started with your organization that would have made your onboarding easier as a neurodivergent person? And I got thousands of comments. <laughs> um, everything from like the comment about, I would love to be able to wear a hat in the office. I would love to keep my headphones on. I would love a quiet space on my floor where no one is allowed to talk so I can focus. Um, to bigger things like no one told me that we could wear um, shorts. And so I've been burning up in the office for six months because I didn't figure out that people were allowed to wear shorts. Um, some people, they felt uncomfortable socializing with their colleagues. And so they would eat lunch at their desk and then their colleagues would feel uncomfortable inviting them and it would lead to um, poor communication and poor collaboration. Addressing that and saying, hey, most of the team goes to lunch at 11. You're welcome to join anytime you want, but if you prefer to eat at your desk, that's perfectly fine. We'll hang out another time. That turns out everyone appreciates. <laughs> um, those are all kinds of little things that we just expect new hires to pick up and neurotypicals might be able to pick those up. Um, but why do we keep them secret? Why do we expect them to pick it up? Bring it to the forefront, address it. I, as a boss, I tell my team, I'm available at this phone from these hours to these hours. If you need me, I will answer you between these hours if you text my phone. I'm a person who likes to start a meeting on time. And so if somebody walks in two minutes after, it's a little bit annoying for me. So I make that clear. If, uh, if you can get there a minute before the meeting, I really appreciate that and respect it. Maybe people will not always feel that way, or maybe they're always, or maybe they're running late. But at least they know, and they're not having to pick up on that. Um, it speeds the onboarding process. It speeds the environment of inclusion, and it really helps um, people feel seen and addressed. And that is something you can do for free. It's a matter of putting together a PowerPoint deck. So um, there are little things that you can do without needing to change your entire organizational structure. But it is possible <laughs> to do both. So. Yeah. Thank you. This is those are great resources that can you be used, especially for um, employees who maybe aren't identifying as part of a neurotypical group, mm -hmm. and how they want to support that. Um, that's really good. Good advice. Uh, even just like you said, going out there and asking questions about what do you need and, and how can we better support you. Being more proactive about communications of what's expected and what isn't. Mm -hmm. Really, really great stuff. Uh, along those lines, you know, you'd mentioned it. This. There's things you can do without having to change the organization. Having an employee resource group mm -hmm. uh, like Ables and Allies, that's great. But mm -hmm. some of the people in our comments are already talking about how they're not a part of an organization that has an employee yeah. resource group like that. So um, how can they uh, find ways, tools, coping mechanisms in cases like that? So there are a couple of websites, and I'll share those with you and Daniela. We could share them with the recording that'll go out after. There are a couple of websites that I recommend, um, but also utilize the tools that we have. We all have phones. We all have social media, for better or for worse. <laughs> Use it to your advantage. Um, LinkedIn is a great place to follow neurodivergent as a hashtag or to follow autism as a hashtag, ADHD at work as a hashtag. Um, you'll see thinkers and speakers and people who care about this process they'll be posting follow them dm them have a cup of coffee with somebody um i i'm sure that there is a reddit for every group <laughs> every possible condition um there are online forums where you can find communities that may not reside within your specific organization but they can give you coping mechanisms and resources that can help you to develop the organization that you want um, I understand I've worked for smaller companies before that don't have the resources that Philips does, or maybe you have 10 employees in your company and there's not enough people for an engagement group like that. You can still talk to HR about how do we make our policies more transparent? How do we make our communications more direct? And share the, the stats of how that direct concise communication can improve engagement scores. Share how other companies are seeing increased profitability because of embracing neurodiversity. Um, I 
I don't know any boss who would say, I don't want to make more money. <laughs> and so if you frame it as that, of we can make more money if we do these things, you'll have a receptive audience. Um, it is unfortunate that a lot of times the onus of doing this is on the individual contributors, but most people want their employees to feel engaged and understood and included um, because that's when people are most productive. <laughs> and so um, speaking to your manager, even if you don't say, I am neurodivergent, I need care. If you say, I care about this topic <laughs> and I would like to, to do more with it, most of the time you're going to find support from your bosses. Um, if your boss isn't supportive, talk to another boss, talk to HR, talk to the CEO if you can. Um, most people are going to be willing to hear. And again, the worst thing that people will say is, I don't have time for this. And at least then you have an answer of, is this an organization that is going to support me or are they not? And then you know. Um, I know of one that will, if you want to come work for Philip. <laughs> so I can give you a reference. I think there's going to be a lot of people going to take you up on that. <laughs> That's great advice for advocating for yourself because all, all the allies in the world at the end of the day, you know, everybody has to make sure they're taking care of themselves, looking out yeah. for themselves. So that's great advice for advocating, for being able to go. And even as you said, even if you don't want to personally self-identify, mm -hmm. by just saying, well, in this case, I'm acting as an ally, even though it is really for your own best interest. That's wonderful. Yeah. Talk to us more. You Look, a little tongue in cheek when you say, I know a company that has. <laughs> well, that's part of why we're here. Talk to us a little bit more about how yeah. Phillips has really publicized, got more membership, really uh, helped make everybody aware of Ables and Allies. Sure. Um, so we have a, an incredible inclusion and diversity team. I think a couple of them are on the call and I um, thank them for all the work that they've done because it's been helpful to me and to other employees. And I, I do want to stress, Philips is a large organization. We have a lot of resources at, that other companies may not have. Um, but what we mostly have is leadership buy-in. <laughs> we have leaders that say, yes, this is part of our values. And yes, I want this program to have a chapter on site at my office. And so we'll use the neurodiversity network that just started a few months ago. Um, in that case, I wasn't involved in the founding of it, but I assume they went to our IND team and said, we want this group. And they said, absolutely, let's set you up a page on our internal social network site um, where people can go and become members and you can organize from there. And then once that page was launched, all of the other ERGs that we have in Philips to address uh, different marginalized groups, um, they received a notice of, hey, there's this new one starting. Share it with your friends, with your colleagues. You might want to join this one too. Um, you're more than welcome to join. And so that information got disseminated through our social networks and through our ERGs and also through our office communications. So um, when Neurodiversity Network launched, I um, received an email from our local about it to say, did you know that this is starting? You should take part and uh, enjoy. And so if you're in a smaller company, again, it might be a sign on a refrigerator. <laughs> it might be an announcement during a team meeting. That is okay. Um, work with the tools that you have. Um, but yes, that is one of the ways that Philips uses the tools that we have at our disposal um, to build membership and communicate clearly. So. Something to clarify, you use mm -hmm. the term chapter and actually a joy had this question from the audience. Is mm -hmm. the Ables and Allies a national group with chapters in specific areas? So yeah, yes, um, in international group, uh, so global group, but um, for example, we have a, a veterans ERG for veterans and family coalition. The veterans group is national and they do um, many events at different cities, but Nashville is very close to Fort Campbell where the 101st Airborne is. And so Nashville has a high concentration of veterans and family um, Phillips employees. And so we have local chapters that do some local events. They'll do volunteering at Fort Campbell um, to help employees um, and their families there. So you'll see smaller events taking place locally, but they're all tied to a central um, diversity and inclusion um, what's the word I'm looking for, program, <laughs> essentially. Um, and they share the same values and communications that way. So for neurodiversity, it is largely virtual because um, we're still kind of getting it off the ground. So you'll see a lot of webinars and calls and opportunities to learn. Um, but maybe eventually we'll have one where there'll be a small group every at every office. Who knows? We'll get there. <laughs> Certainly with the goals that they have, of what percentage mm -hmm. of their 
employee group is representative by people part of neurodiverse communities. I'm sure that, that yeah. probably is the future. Yeah. You know, Heather, there's been so much great stuff that we've discussed, but okay. we are getting a ton of questions from the audience. Sure. So whereas normally we would probably put like the last 10 minutes, let's mm -hmm. let's jump in if you don't mind. Yeah. There's a lot of really great ones. Mm -hmm. Um so Susan had offered uh, asked about for more description for some of these supports that Phillips has mentioned, right? You've mm -hmm. been giving a little bit more, but any other details on specific things that Phillips is doing to help su support neurodivergent people? Yeah. Um, so we're still working and we're still building. We're still growing. I don't want to think we have everything solved. So <laughs> Susan, <laughs> uh, we'll work on that. Um, but what we do have right now is a community of care. Um, so people can share their experience and say, oh, my manager has been super flexible. Well, my manager hasn't. How did you get that um, to work? And they're able to work together and collaborate on effective strategies to change behaviors locally. Um, they've also started doing education opportunities. So whether that's webinars like these uh, that we do internally or book clubs or joining up with other ERGs and partnering with those other groups um, to build awareness, the more education that you do, the more investment you get, <laughs> the more people start to live these behaviors. Um, we are still working towards um, having a, a strong sphere of influence specific to neurodiversity where um, Phillips will commit to a certain hiring quota. Um, we haven't quite gotten there yet, but we will. I am confident that we will because Tristan is a, a very um, influential person and I'm sure he'll get it done. But yeah, um, sorry, I don't have a better answer, but we are still working through this. Susan. <laughs> no, that's a great answer. It's yeah. a lot of things they're working on. Um, mm -hmm. Here's, a, here's a, I think, an important question. D. Ross had asked this. Mm -hmm. We using this term neurodiversity and like so many terminology, it is a bit of an umbrella, but yeah. Dewa specifically was wondering if someone who has a non-diagnosed situation or self-diagnosed, or even it's just like a perceived condition or quote unquote mm -hmm. personality type, you mm -hmm. know, oh, this person's introverted or they're shy. They're just socially awkward. Yeah. Are those things part of the neurodiverse community? So... How it's defined will usually differ from company to company. Um, in general, neurodiverse communities consider autism, ADHD, mental health disorders like anxiety, depression, OCD, um, and learning disabilities like dyspraxia, dyslexia, dyscalculia. <laughs> Those are kind of the four big groups. Um, you'll see some subgroups like acquired neurodivergency, so TBIs um, or post-stroke cognition issues that where somebody has now suddenly become neurodivergent. They tend to fall under the umbrella and also things like stuttering, Tourette syndrome, those can also cause um, discrimination to happen and they are all tied to neurological differences. But in general, we're talking about autism, ADHD, mental health and learning disabilities or disorders. Um, what your company wants to call it is, you can make that definition as wide or as narrow as you want to. But in general, that's what you're gonna see when you're talking to other experts who are smarter than I am, so. <laughs> I hope that Anna explains it. Thank you. That's very helpful. Now we had a couple of questions during your presentation. There were some things that you mentioned that I think people wanted a little more details on, wanted to dig in a little bit more. Mm -hmm. uh, for instance, Christy was wondering, um, how do you talk to an employer during the interview process to help them kind of realign their perception of what productivity will be? Uh, helping them to understand, hey, the way I think and the way I work you need to expect a different level of productivity from me than somebody else. So that is, it's difficult. I'm not going to lie, Christy. <laughs> um, and that's a very good question. And a lot of that is really contingent on the company being prepared. Because if someone were to come in who had Tourette syndrome, their interview is going to go differently than someone who doesn't. We know that. And that manager it's usually making pretty quick snap judgments on, do I want to work with this person? Do I not? And it can be hard to overcome that and change the perspective. So I would encourage you to tell the recruiter ahead of the interview, um, if you can, to say, just making you aware, I do have this neurodivergence um, and I will need accommodations during the interview. Um, one way that SAP has accommodated employees in those situations is 
changing the questions to be more situational, to allow time to breathe, to say we can always come back um, with uh, follow-up questions if we need to, just to create a space that is welcome and open and flexible. Um, that is something that companies need to do. We're still working through that. A lot of companies need to do that. Um, so you as an employee, the best thing that you can do is let them know and let them know how you will present and then make sure to address, yes, I um, may have trouble distinguishing body language, but I'm excellent at finding every defect in our code <laughs> and I will find it. Um, lean into those possibilities and lean into um, how you can bring talent to the table. Neurodivergence is not a superpower. I want to be careful to, to say that, but it does bring different skills and different perspectives. Um, so hopefully you can convince them at the table. Excellent advice. Uh, here's another question for clarification. Mm -hmm. uh, Yania had mentioned, um, and during your presentation, you used this specific example. Um, <laughs> no microwaving fish, the smell <laughs> so overpowering that for some people with certain types of neurodiversity. Well, yeah. she says, look, she's Hispanic. I am too. Mm -hmm. Yo soy Boricua. So there's a lot of very strong smells that might go along with somebody's cultural food. Sure. So and, go ahead. Yeah, and that was, uh, I shouldn't be so glib with that. It's an inside joke. Um, but um, a member of my team left her fish in the microwave for very, uh, like 20 minutes. She set it for 20, walked away, came back, and it was about a week of stench before we uh, were able to clear it out. So shouldn't have used that phrasing. But um, smells are a strong trigger for certain neurodivergent types. So it is something to be mindful of. Um, if it is possible to have the office kitchen on a different floor, or if it's possible for somebody who is neurodivergent to work on a separate floor from where the microwave is, um, or at least um, specific rules like lunchtime is from 11 to one, please try and microwave your food during that time. Those are ways that you can incorporate inclusivity of both culture and neurodivergence because you want everyone to be productive and you want everyone to bring themselves to the table. Um, so that's when that flexibility comes into play. Um, most people who are neurodivergent will tell you, I don't want the world to bend to me. I just want the flexibility for me to navigate within this world. And so that's an example. I don't want someone to stop bringing in their cultural food. I love, I love Mexican food <laughs> and um, would eat curry every day if it was up to me. But um, I also want to be mindful of not wearing too strong of perfumes or, um, you know, strong colognes and strong food smells in spaces where somebody who is neurodivergent can really become overstimulated by those things. Um, it's a balance. So it requires flexibility from all parties. And I think that is really reliant on management leadership to create that culture of flexibility where people feel comfortable bringing themselves to the table. So, yeah. Excellent. That's a, that's a lot of really good context there. Yeah. Um, another one from the, from the conversation or from the presentation. You mentioned under, I think it was in a lot of behavior mm -hmm. about making sure as an organization that you are actually living the standards mm -hmm. that you're preaching, which would include, and you use the term discipline. So, mm -hmm. so Katie was, or Kate, I'm sorry, was wondering, mm -hmm. what are some examples of, of discipline in a case like this? In that case, I'm usually referring to just a one-off coaching conversation. Um, if you hear about a manager who is discriminating or not addressing um, living the behaviors that you have set forth for your company, pull them aside and say, this is what we value. This is how you performed. Have that critical conversation and say, here's what I would like to see from you in the future. Consider that I don't know, a verbal warning. Um, have potential policies in place so that if a neurodivergent employee comes to HR, HR is not caught off guard on how to approach that situation um, and is able to mediate discussions between an employee and a neurodivergent employee um, if they have conflict. Um, by doing that, you're creating a space where you're telling your neurodivergent employees that we care enough to have planned ahead for this and we care enough to address the behavior. Um, if you don't address that behavior, you're telling those employees, we really don't care that much. This is all just uh, word of mouth. This is all just fluff and we don't like fluff. Um, so 
that is really what I'm talking about. I don't think anyone should be fired. Like I said at the beginning, I want um, people to learn and grow and we need to allow people grace while they develop. But I do think it's important to hold people accountable and say, these are our values. You signed up for those values when you joined the company. Here's how I want to see you behave with those values in mind in the future. Excellent. Yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, you know, and I think this is having some of these people ask some of these clarifying questions and, and giving more context to some of the things you said in presentation. This is a classic example of practicing what you preach there, right? Like you talked mm -hmm. about how important communication is, clear communication, giving examples and details. And here you're doing that for the group. And it's mm -hmm. a great way to show like, this is how easy it can be to mm -hmm. make sure that you're being very intentional with the way they communicate, right? And how you can, when asked, give specific examples so that it helps those who may not, uh, maybe aren't understanding the general context of it. We really mm -hmm. appreciate that, Heather. Yeah. Of course. Um, and I also will tell you, I'm not an expert here <laughs> in any of this. So um, if you have suggestions or if I don't know the answer, I hope I can direct you to the right people <laughs> who can. So um, these are very good questions, though. I really appreciate them. Um, well, whatever level of expertise you may feel you do or don't have, I, the, <laughs> I think giving everybody is very much appreciated. Here's, here's a really interesting scenario that's been brought up by a couple of people here. Jennifer was mentioning that she's starting a, a similar type of ERG of, you know, ables and allies. Mm -hmm. um, and he's getting a, some initial feedback. Sarah R has a very similar situation where she's in a company that preaches about how open and inclusive they are and discusses, mm -hmm. you know, all kinds of things with consultants, like how to be more gender inclusive, uh, how to make sure they're caring for members of the LGBTQ plus community. Mm -hmm. But yet both Jennifer and Sarah are kind of running into the same issue, which is that the concept of neurodiversity gets brought up and very quickly feedback starts running to, is this just an excuse for, for bad behavior, for lazy performance, for underperformance? Is this just people being difficult? Mm -hmm. How do we address that? So, and here's where my expertise fails. Um, I have encountered this with every ERG I've been a part of. Um, and I think leaders of ERGs will tell you that this is a pretty common thing. Um, and that comes from a lack of uh, understanding and a lack of empathy. Um, where people just don't understand. They're like, well, I have to work five days a week in the office. Why does she get to work five days at home? It's not fair. And once you understand what that person has to overcome just to function as a person to um, be at the same level of productivity that you are you understand that it's it's basically like saying well i'm able to walk with with uh both legs why does he need a cane why does he get a seat and it's silly <laughs> but because it's kind of invisible it's hidden and a lot of people aren't open about their nerves it's harder for people to understand so in those situations, I really encourage companies to work on education, focus on sharing the experiences of the employees who are um, needing support, who are, whether it's uh, physically disabled or mentally dealing with neurodiversity or divergence, sorry. Um, give those experiences so many times. I have learned brand new information from people just telling me their story. Um, there are always going to be detractors. It's unfortunate you can't always get 100% of people on board. So for those situations, I would really encourage you to focus on giving the employees who want to be a part of the ERG a safe space to do that and to grow, and then externally focus on uh, educating the other employees, because that cultural awareness will also lead to a diversity of perspectives and will help them understand, oh, this person has a very different life than I do, even though we work at the same office, I should be able to adapt. If they're not able to do that, it's unfortunate, but there's chances are they're probably never gonna get on board. And so that's when you need to choose to focus on the people who do want to improve and uh, focus on changing the culture to where they're the outlier and the rest of the company is inclusive. So it's not a perfect system, unfortunately. Um, I will also add, if you have some ERGs and not yet have one focused on neurodiversity, I really encourage you to work with those groups because marginalized communities have a lot of shared characteristics and there might be um, overlapping needs, there might be overlapping concerns, overlapping questions. 
use those groups. And also those are groups that are very used to welcoming new perspectives into their group and creating a, a welcoming space. Um, so I really encourage you to partner if you have uh, a Black employee resource group or an LGBTQ employee resource group. Work with those groups to say, I'm starting this one, would love buy-in, would love to share best ideas. Use that group as a starting point for yourself and you'll find a group of people who are inclusive and they'll be there to support you. So. Very well said, Heather. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, great advice both to those who might uh, be part of the neuro neurodiverse community, but also really good advice to the allies out there who want to help make a difference. That's really, mm -hmm. really powerful stuff. I want to ask one last question, and we want to thank mm -hmm. the audience so much for your involvement. And there were so many questions and so many uh, thoughts and everything, and thank you so much. But we like to end a lot of our webinars. I'm going to ask you to think back and reach through time and space and give your younger self some advice. <laughs> I oh, that, That's a curveball. Um, I think I would tell myself to be more authentic early on. Um, you work in sales. I work in sales <laughs> um, to a certain extent. So we're very used to branding and personal like perspective and having to be on point. And that is where I learned a lot of those traits of weakness is difference <laughs> or difference is weakness and vice versa. Um, I'm now more mature. I'm now in a place of privilege where I can say, screw you. I'm going to wear what I want. <laughs> I can have tattoos if I want to. I can um, express my needs and desires, even if they're different from what you are. I wish I had done that instead of driving myself to a hospital <laughs> um, before I realized I had to. So I think authenticity can sometimes be scary, especially in a corporate world where you may not want to be <laughs> the tallest blade of grass that will get mowed down. But more often than not, it will lead to better relationships, uh, better and more inclusive work-life balance, and a more inclusive workplace. Um, so the more people who are authentic, the more it becomes natural for others to reveal their authentic selves. So I wish I had done that instead of trying to fit myself into a box that I didn't belong in for years on end. So, yeah. Heather, your, your candidness, your honesty, your transparency, you're willing to be so vulnerable with us. We cannot thank you enough. It's so wonderful and so helpful to everybody who's participating. And, and to everybody else who didn't get a chance to see this live, you're going to be seeing the recording after it gets sent out. Mm -hmm. We all of us say thank you so much, Heather. Thank you're you sharing so much. your experience, this advice. Thank you to Phillips for working hard to address the issue. You, you mentioned more than once, hey, mm -hmm. we don't have it all figured out. Well, that's all right. Nobody ever does. There's always ways to get better. But the fact that Abel's allies are – an ARG that's out there, the fact that you're constantly looking for ways to improve. Thank you so much to Phillips for uh, sponsoring this. Thank you to Heather one last time for sharing your uh, personal experience and everything. And then to the audience, we'll say thank you to that audience. Your participation was very much appreciated. The questions, the comments, thank you all. This has been one of the most uh, involved and really beneficial Fairy God Boss Lives we've done in a long time. Awesome. I'm so glad. Thank you, Joshua, for facilitating. I really appreciate it. And thank you, everyone. I hope we can connect on LinkedIn um, after this and would love to continue the conversations there. So thanks. Absolutely. Thank you, everybody. We'll see you all soon again. Bye.